Hi, Pastor Skip here. Well, I can't be with you this weekend, but I'm thrilled to welcome our guest speaker. Dr. Stephen Collins and his team have been digging around in Jordan, north of the Dead Sea for 15 years, excavating what is believed to be the location of the biblical city of Sodom. He is the author of several fascinating books. We have some of them here at Parchments, and he's also the Dean of the College of Archaeology at Veritas International University. So whether you're joining us for service online or in person at one of our campuses, I know you're going to love hearing Dr. Collins' message entitled, Biblical History, Fact or Fancy? Please join me in welcoming him. It is the 4th of July weekend. And I have my personal flag bearer for me. Thank you. Huh? Oh, it's good to see faces. Hmm? It really is. Haven't seen a lot of those lately. We've been doing all of our teaching, live streaming, and uh, no students in the classroom. So it's, it's nice. It's good to see you. All right, give yourself a hand. Thanks for being here. So as I've been saying recently, um, Elvis may have left the building, but logic and reason have left the country. Well, enough about that. Don't get me off on that. I'll get in big trouble. Okay. We're going to talk about, um, as Skip said, biblical history, fact, or fancy. Now, we could ask the question, why in the world does this matter? What's the point of this? Can't we just believe in Jesus and go on about our business? Well, you could, but if we continue to take that approach, as the church has taken for the last couple thousand years, we're going to lose the culture. We just, we, we're losing the culture. That approach just doesn't work because everything from the foundation to the Messiah all has to be taken into account because the credibility of who Jesus is and the reality of who Jesus is is thoroughly based on the rest of the Bible. So it all goes together as a package. You can't have one without the other. But I want to go ahead and read. I'm gonna, I have a lot of text today, so if you'll um, go with me. I, I wanted to be very specific about some of the things that I said, so I, I put it up in text, and I'm just going to read it. Almost everything that's wrong with the world, nations, societies, governments, the United States of America, every state, our state, every city, our city, towns, communities, every family, you, me, whatever's wrong with us, most of that can be directly attributed to a failure to embrace biblical historicity, a biblical worldview, and, op and operating by biblical principles. To the extent that we fail to do those three things, to that degree, our lives are seriously diminished. All right. Now, we could ask this question. Does your attitude toward the Bible really matter? Yes, absolutely, it does. The vast majority of archaeologists and historians do not believe that the Torah books, the first five books of the Old Testament, are actual history. They don't believe that. But they think it's something like folklore or fiction. It's not real history. Now, this would also include Joshua and Judges, so that we could expand that to the first seven books of the Bible. And I call these seven books the Bronze Age Scriptures because these events, these people and these events belong to what we in archaeology call the Bronze Age, that period of history prior to 1200 B.C. So you can mark that in your Bible. <laughs> Bronze Age, prior to 1200 B.C. Since the balance of the Old Testament and the New Testament would be included in that, of course, since it assumes the historical reality of the Bible's first seven books, that Torah and, and, and those other two books are the foundation of the rest of the Bible. Because that's true, 
we would call the factual legitimacy of the rest of the Old Testament in question if we had to question the, the historicity of the first seven. So if the first seven aren't true, if Genesis isn't foundationally true, what happens to the rest of the Bible? You see? So we just can't, we can't pick and choose. We can't say, well, I really like that New Testament. Eh, the Old Testament. We really don't need that. We just need the New Testament. No, if you don't have the factuality of the Old Testament, you can forget the New Testament because Jesus has no identity and no mission. All right. Here's something that um, I won't say scares me because, you know, I don't operate off fear. Uh, it concerns me. Let me put it that way. Recent estimates from the top pollsters show that 60% of American Christians between the ages of 18 and 25 do not necessarily believe that the Bible is historically reliable. That bothers me a lot. Um, my wife and I were doing a little vacationing this last week, and, and uh, we went where all the New Mexicans went, Colorado. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't elbow your way into a state, federal, or private campground. I mean, there were so many, and 90% of the plates were New Mexico. And um, we ran into a, a nice young couple, Christian, Christians, vocal. The word Sodom, city of Sodom, which I have a little bit of a connection to, uh, came up in the discussion. And it was like looking at a deer in the headlights. What are you talking about? They didn't even know what that was. Is that amazing? There are a lot of Christians who are biblically illiterate. Probably, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. So um, that's scary to me. Well, for most scholars and much of the general public, it's doubtful that Adam and Eve and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Joshua, all those people, even existed at all. And really, they, they don't care. It doesn't really to them, affect their life. Well, let me give you a couple of scholars here. Uh, Niles Peter Limke, I'm, I, I often give this quote from, from him because it's, it's standard belief in the archeological community in which I work that this would be uh, uh, true. By the way, the book, let me tell you how bad things can get. The book from which I took this quote, you know where I bought it? Of course you don't. Right, right here in Albuquerque, I bought it at Bibles Plus. What does that tell you? Well, not anything about Bibles Plus, a whole lot about who doesn't read the books that they put in their bookstores. Here's what Niles Peter Limke says. The patriarchal narratives are fiction, not reality. That world does not represent a real world. It stands outside the usual representation of time and space. As a matter of fact, he says, neither the narratives nor their world can be dated to any precise period. In other words, it's just fiction. Here's Israel Finkelstein. I like Israel. We get along really well. See him every year. He usually attends my papers at ASOR. I attend his. But uh, here's what he says. By the way, he's probably now considered Israel's top archaeologist. He says, combination of archaeological and historical research demonstrates that the biblical account of the conquest and the occupation of Canaan by the Israelites is entirely divorced from historical reality. See, that's what, that's what we're up against. Now, Kenneth Kitchen, uh, I love Ken, University of Liverpool, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, Egyptology, Near Eastern Studies. Um, he takes the Bible seriously. And he wields a big stick, but people try to ignore him, of course. 
But here's what he says. I love this quote. Increasingly extreme views about the Old Testament writings have been trumpeted loudly and all manner of gross misinterpretations of original first-hand data are now being shot forth to prop up these extreme stances regardless of the facts. And so we must firmly say to the liberals, your fantasy agendas are irrelevant in and to the real world, both of today and of all preceding time back to the remotest antiquity, get real or alas, get lost. I love that. Um, so, love you, Ken. Now, when we started our excavation at Sodom uh, back in 2005, two years after that, the Wall Street Journal ran a front page, top of the fold uh, a feature article on our excavations. And in that, um, Dr. Bill Deaver, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona, had this to say to me. So they went and scrounged up uh, uh, Dr. Deaver to get him to speak to my view of how to use the Bible in archaeology. And here's what he said. He says, no responsible scholar goes out with a trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. Now, that's a little tongue-in-cheek, I know, because uh, I've had Bill come, I, I've flown him into Albuquerque twice over the past couple of decades in order to uh, give lectures to my students and all that. We get along really well. And, uh, but every year at ASOR, he, you know, we bump into each other uh, in the hallway between papers, and he always says to me, it's like, it's predictable, he says, hey, Steve, you still, still digging for Abraham, are you? And my answer now is always, found him, Bill, found him. But my response to him is always this. Um, it's, it's irresponsible for uh, an archaeologist to go digging in the Holy Land without a trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. Where is it? There it is. The book. Now, now some people believe that this is the Word of God. I do too. Some people believe that this, this book is factually inerrant. I do too, but I don't hold either one of those positions in a doctrinaire way. I believe the Bible is inerrant because I've been studying it for 50 some odd years and I, find, I, I still, after all that time and investigation, haven't found anything in here I would consider to be in error. So I guess... I'm not a, a deductive inerrantist. I'm an a, a, I'm sorry, I'm not a deductive inerrantist. I'm an inductive inerrantist. In other words, if you think something is some way or another way, investigate it, find out what it is for yourself. Well, I don't find any mistakes in this thing. Yeah, I think it's historically accurate. I think it's historically accurate because it's historically accurate. Ah, that, see that plays. Well, anyway... Um, this is still, bottom line, minimally, the best historical geographical source we have preserved from the ancient world. Period. It just is. There it is. So, if you're an archaeologist and you don't use this, if you're going to work in that part of the world and you don't use this book as a framework for understanding your, your interpretation of the history through the archaeology, then, well, good luck with that. You're going to come up short, uh, and you're not really going to understand what you're doing. That's my take on it. Well, the foundation for rejecting biblical historicity, because all of these, most of these guys do. They just reject the historicity of the Bible out of hand. Why do they do that? Well, the foundation of that is the erroneous notion and this comes from what I call the pre-archaeology 19th century, the late 1800s. There was an idea that came to, to bear back then that Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch or the Torah for a whole variety of reasons. So they came up with this laundry list of reasons why Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch. And it was based on the state of knowledge or the state of Near Eastern studies or archaeology at the time. Oh, in the, in the, eight, in the late 1800s, archaeology didn't exist. 
Near Eastern studies, oh, didn't exist. Okay, so they're going to pontificate that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch based on ideas that they had in the late 19th century. Let me just give you one of a whole list of these things. One, one was that a, an alphabetic phonemic writing system, now there were hieroglyphics in Egypt since 3000, before 3000 BC and cuneiform before 3000 BC, but an alphabetic writing system like we have, you know, 20 to 30 letters, simple to represent the range of vocalization. Um, that didn't exist until, and this was what they believed in the 19th century, that didn't exist until about 1000 BC. Well, since Moses is writing about 1400 BC, he doesn't have an alphabet. See how they think? Well, if the alphabet wasn't invented until 1000 BC, and Moses is supposedly writing 400 years earlier, he cannot have written the Torah. He doesn't have the writing system to do it. Well, they came up with this idea that Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch. And by the way, this is still the predominant view today. This is, this is still what most scholars think today. This is the foundation of Israel Finkelstein's thinking, of Limke's thinking. But what's interesting about that is within 20 or 30 years of the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, all of the litany of the list of, of reasons why Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch had completely evaporated based on the emerging archaeology and Near Eastern studies. For example, I'll just go back to that one example. It was discovered that phonemic writing, the phonemic writing system, the alphabetic writing system, the Semitic alphabet was invented by Semitic people, Hebrews, living in Egypt hundreds of years before the time of Moses. So if that alphabet was written, was invented hundreds of years before Moses, do you suppose Moses might have had access to it? See? And so all of a sudden, the whole reason to reject the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch just evaporated, just went away. But Old Testament scholars kept believing in a vacuum. They ignored archaeology. They ignored all of this new data. They just kept believing it. Well, why would they do that? If this outmoded 19th century theory, and we call it the documentary hypothesis, if this thing has been exploded by the archaeological evidence, why in the world would the vast majority of scholars still believe this stuff? Well... The answer is a little unfortunate, but it's real simple. They can't allow the Bible to be factual because what it teaches interferes with their personal lifestyles. If the Bible was any way considered to be factual, it just might mean that the God of the Bible would have some sort of say in what they do or don't do. And they don't want that. They want to suspend reason, therefore, in favor of doing their own thing. The definition of that, by the way, is sin. Okay, it's very simple. People don't want the Bible to be true. They want to hold it at arm's length simply because they don't want it impacting the way they want to do things. So there it is. It's... So rejecting the Bible is not a scientific, historical, logical, reasonable decision. It is simply a moral decision or an immoral one, if you like. Well, the historicity of the Bronze Age Bible. Now, we're going to do a little Bronze Age Bible. I know you're just excited. You woke up this morning going, I, I really got to get some Bronze Age Bible in today. And uh, later we're going to do a little Iron Age Bible, but I just want to quickly go through. Now, the point of this whole thing is this. That little documentary hypothesis that so many people believe that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, that it was, writ that it was written around the time of the Babylonian captivity, sometime around the 7th, 6th, 5th centuries B.C., kind of before, during, and after the Babylonian captivity, by Judahite priests inventing a fictitious history for Israel, if that were true, 
none of the things I'm going to show you from the Bronze Age scriptures should be there. We would expect, if Iron Age people are writing these stories, making these stories up, those alleged Bronze Age stories from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier should be chock full of Iron Age anachronisms. Let me give you an example. If you today lost any kind of historical memory you had and you just didn't know anything about the 1920s, you didn't know anything before the year 2000. Maybe you didn't know anything before the year 2015. You only know from 2015 forward. You're just locked where you are, focused where you are. Now you're going to write a story about the roaring 20s. Do you suppose you might have somebody answering their cell phone in the 1920s? Yes, because you didn't know. You wouldn't know they didn't have that in the 1920s. You'd have them wearing 2020 clothes. See, it would all be full of anachronisms because you don't know what that world looks like. Well, guess what? People living in the Iron Age, Iron Age Judahite priests living around the time of the Babylonian captivity would know nothing about the previous century, much less time frames, centuries and centuries and centuries before that. They wouldn't know anything about that. So we would predict that their writings, if this were true, if the documentary hypothesis really happened, we would expect all of these alleged Bronze Age stories from hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, five, six, eight hundred years earlier, to be full of Iron Age stuff. Well, they're not. And I'm going to show you some things here that demonstrate that all of the stories that we read in the Torah um, literature are actually deriving from and our eyewitness or near eyewitness accounts of the events that are being written long, long time before the Iron Age. Here's one, the Fertile Crescent. The Bible talks about the Fertile Crescent, talks about Mesopotamia, talks about Abraham making this trip from Ur of the Chaldees all the way up over the Fertile Crescent, down into Canaan. Well, let's put the map up, that'll help. So um, he's going to take this trip and he's going to go from there all the way over the, the Fertile Crescent. Now, why is that significant? Because the Bible gives us a clear geography that we know in the modern world, from modern research into the ancient world, that the Fertile Crescent is indeed the cradle of civilization. Well, the Bible has it exactly right. Judahite priests living in the Iron Age didn't know that, Would have, wouldn't have any clue of that, where the origins of civilization came from, but yet the Bible nails it precisely. Here's another one, Abraham's covenant with Yahweh, with Abimelech. Guess what? They match the treaty structures of the Middle Bronze Age when Abraham was supposed to be living. Ancient treaties change structure radically over time. Iron Age covenants, contracts, and treaties look absolutely nothing like Bronze Age treaties. Completely different. So you would expect if Iron Age folks are making up the story about Abraham, that the covenants he makes would be very similar to the Iron Age ones that they know, because they don't know anything else but that. Guess what? They're not. They're exactly what they're supposed to be, matching those covenants and treaties of the Middle Bronze Age from the time of Abraham. So how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen unless the stories are factual. Here's one. Oh, I have a little connection to this. Um, Sodom and the cities of the Kikar. Well, you can read this. So I'm just going to summarize this real quick. The Bible says the stories, the, the cities of the plain existed, that Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities actually existed when scholars were saying, no, these are fiction. Not only did we find them based on the biblical geography, we've been excavating them for 15 years we find everything that the Bible describes about those cities, massive. Sodom is the largest continuously occupied city during the Bronze Age in the southern Levant. I've written now several chapters for other people, secular scholars' works based on the, uh, that, that fact because it's so important for the archaeology itself. But biblically, we go one step beyond the science is now showing us very clearly that Sodom and the cities of the plain were actually destroyed by a 
catastrophic meteoritic airburst, fire out of the sky consumed 400 square kilometers of a civilization like that in an instant. Exactly as the Bible describes it in Genesis 19. Well, I don't think that's a coincidence. And by the way, those things don't happen very often. In fact, this is the only airburst we know, one of the few airbursts we know over a populated area in the entire history of the planet. Just so happens to be exactly where the Bible describes the city of Sodom to be. Um, here's some of the excavation, just a little bit of piece of the palace. Uh, here's the gate area, a reconstruction of the excavation of the uh, gate of Sodom. And um, here's the city of Sodom by Dr. Lane Rittmeyer based on our excavations. Uh, pretty impressive thing. So they really exist. Here's another one, just a little item. Joseph was sold into slavery for, do you remember how much? Well, I just told you, right? 20 shekels, 20 shekels. Now, guess what? The going price of a slave in the Middle Bronze Age, toward the end of the Middle Bronze Age, when Joseph should have actually been living, is what? It's 20 shekels. But the interesting thing about this is that through time, shekels, uh, the shekels for a slave got more and more and more expensive, right? Inflation. The more things change, the more they stay the same, <laughs> okay? In Moses' time, which is just 300 years, of 200 and some odd years later, it went to 30. It was up to 30 shekels. And in the Mosaic law, if you're going to replace a slave, it's 30 shekels. Guess what the going price of a slave is in the late Bronze Age in the time of Moses? It's 30 shekels. Not only does the Torah literature get the price of slave, slaves correct, it gets the subtle inflationary curve correct. Now, how do you do that if you're living in the late Iron Age when the price of a slave has exceeded 120 shekels? How would you know what the right prices were hundreds and hundreds of years before that period of time? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. In fact, you wouldn't even be able to read the, the scripts and the languages in which those ancient records were written because Abraham didn't speak Hebrew. Okay. Neither did Moses. They spoke Canaanite or Akkadian. They operated in those languages. And so there wouldn't be any point for late Judahite priests in the Iron Age to, to do research because they couldn't read what they were researching anyway. So how did they get that stuff in there? That had to come from existing documents that derived from those ancient periods themselves. Here's one, the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law is from the late Bronze Age. Remember, we talked about covenants, contracts, and treaties changing radically over time. Well, guess what? Moses' law code is structured just like a Hittite suzerainty treaty from the late Bronze Age. Not from any earlier time, not from any later time, from that time. Now, I don't have time to go into how Moses got hooked up with Hittites. I do have a whole thing that I do on that, but not today. But... The time frame is what's important here. Moses' covenant looks exactly like the covenants of the late Bronze Age. They are authentic in every way to that period. Here's another one, the Exodus events. In the entire 300-year stretch of possible dates for the Exodus, I'm talking about from the 15th century all the way down to the time of Ramesses the Great in the 12th century. That's the Yule Brenner one, right? Now, in that time frame, there is uh, one massive catastrophic collapse of Egypt. And Egypt, for the whole stretch, is doing great for most of that time. Except there is one point where there is a catastrophic collapse of the great 18th dynasty. Why did it collapse? Well, scholars have never been, Egyptologists have never really been able to give us a good reason why the 18th dynasty collapsed, because there's really no good answer for that, except the biblical answer, which is five terrible things. Plagues, plundering, loss of a large labor force, 
decimation of military, loss of Pharaoh himself, five terrible things that happened to Egypt during the time of the Exodus. And by the way, that's exactly the time, this collapse of the 18th dynasty happens exactly in the time frame that the Bible specifies the Exodus occurred. And if you look in the footnotes of the Egyptologists about why, about the 18th dynasty collapse, you will see something very interesting. They will say one of the things that was still happening in the, in the decades after the 18th dynasty went belly up were plagues in Egypt. Egypt was still suffering plagues that had helped bring down the 18th dynasty. Well, is that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence because the Bible fills it in. And here's your Pharaoh, the Exodus, by the way. It's not Yul Brenner, Ramses the Great. It's Tutmos the Fourth. When he died, the 18th dynasty collapsed. When he died, the 18th dynasty collapsed. And there he is. Uh, looking a little beef jerky-ish at this point in his life. But by the way, uh, savor this little moment. I don't, you know, I don't know if you, you probably don't think like I do. I don't know too many people who do. My brain's a little strange. But I look at this and I go, you know what? How many biblical characters can you actually look into their face? Their actual face. That's the face that Moses was looking at when he said, let my people go. There he is. I think that's just cool. Anyway, that's the way my brain works. Israelite literacy. Now, um, you may not know this, but Yahweh required that Israel be literate, that the people of Israel learn how to read. And we get that from Deuteronomy 27 because it was said to Moses and Joshua that as you cross that river, now Moses didn't get to go, but as Joshua crossed the river, the order from God was that they were to set up three large stones plastered over with the words of the law written. Now, why would you do that? Unless you wanted everybody passing over into the land of Canaan as they came in to read the words of the law. Public literacy. By the way, public literacy is interesting. It didn't exist prior to this time. Cuneiform system of writing is very difficult. That's professional scribes. The only people that can work that system. Hieroglyphics in Egypt, professional scribes. That's pretty much it. Average guy does not know how to read and write. But now that we've got this new alphabet invented by Israelites living in Egypt during their captivity, their bondage in Egypt, and now it has come out. And they have 40 years wandering around in the wilderness to do what? You learn how to read and write. I mean, you got nothing else to do. So they learned how to read and write. So they could read the law as they went into the promised land. And guess what? Isn't it interesting that an alphabet that would allow the average person to be able to read, that the alphabet never rose in the history of the world up until that point. And by the way, no alphabet has ever come after that. Every alphabet in the world today is a derivative of the original Semitic alphabet. Every single one, for every language. If it has an alphabet, it's a derivative of that. So once in the history of the planet, the alphabet rises, just coincidentally at the time when Israelites were demanded to be able to read the law? I don't think so. That's not a coincidence. That's of divine design. And so, there we are. Joshua's conquest. When Joshua uh, crossed over the river, he went into an Egyptianless Canaan. Now you say, well, so what? Canaan was completely annexed and, and, and controlled by Egypt. In, uh, from about 1550 B.C. down to the time of the, uh, of the collapse of the 18th dynasty, the time of Moses. We'll say, so what? God had promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Joshua that he was going to bring them into a land of Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and all kinds of ites, but no Egyptians. 
Canaan and Syria, the whole Levant, was part of Egypt up until the time of the collapse of the 18th dynasty at the time of the Exodus. When Joshua came into the promised land, it was a land of Hittites, Canaanites, and Amorites. No Egyptians in sight. So it's not only historically accurate, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. <laughs> okay? All right. Battle of Jericho. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. He comes across the river. He attacks Jericho. Here's the, here's, here's the synchronism. Here's the specificity of this. There was no Jericho from about 1600 down to about 1400. No Jericho. Jericho only existed because, by the way, it was taken out as collateral damage at the time of the destruction of Sodom, I think. It's just across the river. So just kind of collateral damage. But it went out of business for 300 years. 300 years. Around 1400 B.C., the city of Jericho came back up as a fortified town. Joshua, given the proper framework of the Exodus, Joshua's conquest would have occurred 40 years, started 40 years later. Guess what? Right at the time that Jericho had been operating now again for about 30 or 40 years. Now, I always say poor Jericho couldn't catch a break. They got knocked out in the destruction of Sodom. <laughs> That's collateral damage. And just about the time they got the, got the city rolling again, here comes Joshua. <laughs> and that was the end of it. Because there is no, after that, there's no Jericho. Before that, there's no Jericho. Right there, at the time the Bible says Joshua would have been destroying Jericho, Jericho exists for a very short space. That's it. You don't have any other options. Now, that's very specific to me. And how would Judahite priests living in the late Iron Age even know something like that? They wouldn't, and it's nonsense to think that they would have. The people of Israel on the Merneptah Stila, this is Ramesses the great son, in about 1210 BC, he mentions Israel as one of the nine perennial enemies of Egypt, one of the nine bows. Well, if they had come into the land of promise sometime around 13 something BC, 1340, 1360 BC, guess what? They have now been there over a hundred years. And they're in the land. And they're mentioned by Merneptah in 1210 as existing in the land. But the interesting thing is, in the Egyptian language, there's a little determinative that you put in there as to whether a people is uh, consist of a, as a kingdom or just as a people without a king, just as a people group or a nation or a kingdom with a king. The one that's used for Israel in the Merneptah Stila, and here it is, is a determinative for a people without a king, a people group without a king. That's exactly what they were at the time, according to the book of Judges. They didn't have a king, but they were a people group of significant power, and they were recognized by the Egyptians. And of course, Merneptah claims to have destroyed them, which he didn't. It was just a brag. Israel, his seed is no more, because if you're a king of Egypt, you have to always say that you killed the nine bows. All right. Well, here's one. Smite, smote, smitten. Just a little English lesson there. Um, there's a phrase in the Old Testament. It says, smite with the edge of the sword. Now, what is, that? what is that? It's an idiom that comes from a particular kind of sword with a single edge. The thrusting pointed sword, double-edged pointed thrusting sword with a, you know, like that. that. That doesn't exist in the time of Joshua. It doesn't exist even before that. That's a late invention from the Iron Age. After about 1000 BC, the sword shifts from being this curved sword with a single edge on the outside. Some call it a scimitar. It's called a sickle sword in archaeology because it looks like a sickle. But that outer cutting edge is what you hack with, okay? To smite with the edge, singular, edge of the sword is an idiom that comes from this sword. Now, what's interesting is, let me go back to that other slide. 
If you look at that last little red comment there, that particular idiom, to smite with the edge of the sword, died out in common use after the sickle sword became extinct. So it's used in Scripture up until the time it becomes extinct, and then after that it trails off and disappears. Now that is a subtle, subtle, perfect coordination with the, with the reality of ev evolution of warfare in antiquity. It's amazing to me that that kind of thing even appears in the Bible. Now, Philistines and Homer. So well, how in the world could the Philistines get hooked, uh, the Bible get hooked up with Homer's Iliad? Well, if you steal something from a foreign god, the Mycenaean Greeks that are being described in, in the Homeric tales had a way of returning something that you stole from a foreign god. And you have a certain procedure to do that. And so the Philistines had stolen, you remember, and this is uh, in uh, 1 Samuel, the Philistines had stolen the Israelite Ark of the Covenant. And everywhere in every Philistine city where that Ark went, God had a little fun with them. I love the old, uh, the old King James rendering of this. It says, he struck them with emeralds or hemorrhoids. And uh, so every place the Ark of the Covenant went, nobody could sit down for a week, you know. It's like, and they got tired of it. So they kept pushing it from city to city till it went to the city of Ekron. And they said, we got to get rid of this thing. You know, uh, we're tired of standing up. And so we got to get rid of it. And so they, they put it on a cart. They put golden mice and hem golden hemorrhoids uh, on, on it, put some cattle with it, and sent it up the road. And there was a big ceremony on the other end. They sacrificed the cattle and all of that. Well, what was that? That same sequence of events, sequence of ritual, is found in the Iliad in returning another object that back then was stolen from a foreign god, and you have to have a protocol to give it back correctly. So he'll quit bothering you. And uh, anyway, this just shows the, the great historical connections that the Bible has far flung, uh, far afield from even what's just in the text. And by the way, the Philistines of the Bible are the descendants of the Mycenaean Greeks who came uh, to the Levant. All right, we're going to spend just a couple of things. I've got about three minutes here. The historicity of the Iron Age Bible. I'm going to go through these really quickly. David and Solomon. It was thought that the kingdoms of David and Solomon were completely fiction by a lot of scholars. That's what they thought. The problem is if you look at all the known kingdoms around the kingdom, what would be the kingdom of Israel, we know what all those kingdoms are, but no, but there's nothing in the middle. Without the kingdom of Israel in the middle, there's nothing. It's a blank. So even if the Bible didn't exist, knowing what, all the, what territories all the other kingdoms occupy, we would predict that there would be a kingdom in the middle of that exactly the size of David's and Solomon's Israel. <laughs> well, that's amazing. The Davidic dynasty. King David was thought to be completely a myth by most scholars. Until very recently, starting back in the 90s, and now several of them have uh, exist, inscriptions in which um, we have the actual name of King David, referring to the dynasty of David, the house of David, Beit David. And here's just one of them, and let me spell it out for you. B -eight, Beit David, the house of David. And this thing appears uh, several times now in inscriptions. Well, when it starts showing up, you can't very well say that David never existed and David didn't have a dynasty. Well, it does. he does. He did. And there it is. Solomon's wealth. This is interesting. Solomon had a lot of, lot of gold, didn't he? I mean, just lots of it. And around the time of his son, King Rehoboam, Shishak of Egypt came and plundered all of that wealth from Jerusalem took it back to Egypt. Well, one year later, Shishak, or Shashank I, died. His son, Ozorkon I, took over Egypt as Pharaoh. What's interesting about that is, 
at that time, in a, in a, it was kind of a depressed time in the history of Egypt, so it, this, Egypt wasn't flying real high. In this depressed history, uh, time of his, uh, Egypt's history, Ozorkon I, the son of Shishak, gave 383 tons of silver and gold to the temples of Egypt. And as Kenneth Kitchen points out, where in the world would he have gotten all of that gold except this is the gold that his father had taken from King, uh, from King Solomon's son, Rehoboam? And it fits perfectly into the history. Well, I've got a whole bunch more, but I'm going to go right to the end. I know you wanted to see all of that. But I want to bring one more, because this is a new one. This is uh, uh, Lawrence Mikitook of Purdue University. We just had him in a class recently at uh, VIU. And he has now positively identified the names of 53 Old Testament characters in non-biblical, extra-biblical inscriptions. In seals, bullae, stele, tablets, cylinders, prisms, all of that outside the Bible. Can you imagine? Inclu and that includes 16 of the 43 kings of Israel and Judah. So you've got 53 Old Testament characters that have been specifically identified by name in extra biblical inscriptions. That's amazing. Okay, well, Kenneth Kitchen is going to get the last word here. He says, the theories current in Old Testament studies were mainly established in a vacuum with little or no reference to the ancient Near East. It is solely because the data from the ancient Near East coincide so much better with the existing observable structure of Old Testament history, literature, and religion than with these theoretical reconstructions that we are compelled to question or even abandon such theories regardless of their popularity. And I'll close with this. Facts not votes, determines the truth. Well, Dr. Deaver, the Bible and the trial do go rather well together. Thank you. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.